Good morning, church. My name is Brett. I am pastor of this people. It's good to see all of you, especially our guests. Welcome. Glad to have you here, and thank you for making us your church home for an hour today. We're going to continue with our series on grace, and we're going to look in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians, chapter 2. And we're going to read a lengthy portion of Scripture, verses 1 through 9. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 9. The title of the message is Grace Received Not Earned. Ephesians 2 1 through 9. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Lord, help us as we study your word today. In this passage, today we're just going to do some Bible study. Not a whole lot of storytelling. We're just going to get in this, this particular passage and try to break it apart, put it back together so that when you walk away, you find yourself more enriched and with a greater understanding of what grace is. Grace is the beautiful package that God has given humanity that allows for his kindness, love, mercy, benevolence, strength, power, provision, all to be encased. And because grace is the the way he has chosen to, to act with us, it gives us encouragement every day because we are limited in our expression of being able to respond well. In fact, it is impossible to, to, for, for us to respond well to God. Impossible. There is no way we could ever spiritually respond the way we should if he had not given us grace to respond the way we should. No way. Why? He says so. Because we were dead. There are some qualities about dead people that are undeniable. I'm not trying to be morbid this morning, but it's hard not to be when you're talking about death. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. If you have the unfortunate occasion to go to a funeral, there are a couple of things you can be pretty sure of. That if you were to, to go to the deceased and yell in his ear, there would be no response. If you were angry with him in life and wanted to reprove him in death and you slapped him, there would be no response. If you poked him with a needle, there would be no response. A dead person cannot respond to stimulus outside of his condition. We can't do anything in and of ourselves to respond to, to the things that we should if something doesn't happen super, supernaturally to help us to do so. We can't make ourselves live. Every one of us, we're dead. Now I know, I know we like to think of ourselves in, in much more laudable terms than being dead people while we lived. It's not very encouraging. We like to think of ourselves as being more kind and, and this passage really speaks to the people that are maybe in, incarcerated. The people who are really, really bad, those folks that we think are the worst of society. But all of humanity, everybody who has been born of Adam, which is everybody, was born into death. Sin is not that which you acquire once you first do something wrong as an 18 month old. And yes, you sinned at 18 months. Probably some of y'all in a year. <laughs> but even when you did it first, you didn't become a sinner then. 
You were born that way. You were conceived that way. There was no way you could not begin the process of sliding down toward what you were. And all your disobedience did was prove that you were born this way. I realize that humanity does some good stuff, but it's because they try hard. We try hard. It's not knee jerk. It's that we realize something needs to be done, so I probably ought to be the one who does it. I, I need to rise above the selfishness that is me. I don't need to respond in kind when they have verbally slapped me and slap them back. I need to take a step back and let the Spirit of God lead me. And We always have to pull the reins on our flesh to not do the wrong thing when we want to do the right thing. And the right thing seems to be that which is laudable all the time when we talk about the goodness of humanity because we all want to feel good about ourselves. But, but if humanity is so good and, and, and some believe getting better, why do we have award shows whereby we talk about people who have done extraordinary things and give them prizes? I mean, if humanity is really good, shouldn't everybody get a prize? The reality that we have a, a, a show like CNN does called Heroes. Have, you, have you, anybody ever seen Heroes? It's, 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 it's the Oscar version of humanity. Somebody out there who is doing the extraordinary, giving their life for the benefit of people, the underprivileged, the underserved, and, and, and nobody's recognizing what they're doing. And so CNN has come alongside and said, let's award and recognize these people and give them a lot of money. And I applaud. Some of those people are outstanding in their service. I just say, wow, you're great. But why do we do it? Because most people don't do that. If everybody did it, we wouldn't need an award show. What we do is we take those who are doing the, the, the extraordinary. We call it extraordinary, but it's really ordinary. If we are really good, then goodness ought to be, goodness ought to be normal. What we consider extraordinary benevolence ought to be knee-jerk. Everybody ought to do it. But because only a few do, it amplifies the fact that what's going on with the rest? If we're good and getting better, what's everybody else doing? Why in the world, why aren't there 50 million candidates for this opportunity? Why do we only have 100 possibilities? Mankind is messed up and it all started from Adam and we cannot fix ourselves. We can't, we are dead. And being dead in our trespasses and sins, we need somebody to raise us. Or we needed, if you were born again, we needed somebody to raise us. Give us new life. Life we could not earn. Life we could not inherit on our own. We couldn't get it naturally from our parents. We couldn't get it from their parents. It didn't come to us like that. The only thing we inherited was death. This is what we call theologically original sin. When Adam sinned, all he could do was produce what he was. So the law in Genesis said this, that whatever is in the ground and produces fruit, the fruit will then produce what was in the ground. So the seed that is in the fruit will produce exactly that which it came from. And so apple trees produced apples. Then they produced another apple tree that produced apples. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but I'm making a point this morning. Adam could only produce what he was. He couldn't make better than he was. He could only give what he had, and what he had was death. When he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when he disobeyed God and, 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 and rebelled against all that was right and proper, death entered into his soul. And when he produced his children along with Eve, all they all they could, could make was a version of themselves. So bad was it, it that, that we have record that in the first generation, that little disobe disobedient act, we would think little 
in comparison to big, bad things. That little thing of just eating from the tr tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it, it wasn't so much that the fruit of the tree was bad. It was that they disobeyed God in doing it. That act, one generation later, it had become murder. Fratricide. Cain killed Abel. Envy. Didn't like that his, meaning, meaning Abel's offering, was acceptable to God. But Cain's was not. And he got mad. Angry, thinking, why in the world? You're busting the curve, dude. Either you're extremely convicted about what I'm saying, or you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say curve. <laughs> they don't do that in school anymore? They don't grade on a curve? Boy, if they hadn't graded on a curve, I don't know if I would have made it. <laughs> <laughs> the curve, oh gosh. There is no 100%. The 100% is whoever gets the highest grade. And then you go from there, and that's the A. And so if it's 90%, 90 then is the 100. And, and if you get 60, now you've got a C. Hallelujah, that was great. <laughs> Jared's with me in that. Abel, you're getting 100. You're busting the curve. You're doing it perfect. And he killed him. That's who we are. Now, there are all kinds of versions of bad, but there are no versions of good. None. None in humanity. Paul says in Romans that no one is good, not one. I realize every once in a while we do what we can to try to help somebody. And, 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 and we rise above the morass of our own degradation and sin. But simply because we do one thing doesn't mean that it somehow dismisses all of the selfishness and evil that is resident in our soul, inherited from our parents and grandparents and Adam. And we give it to our children. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And Paul said, and, and, and because of that, we walked in a way that was improper. It's not just that we had a condition we began to live in such a way that manifested the condition. It was rare when somebody would, would not see who we really were. In fact, we did everything we possibly could to show that we were not who we might think people might see us to be. We didn't want them to see the real person. And so we put on this facade on a regular basis. And it was rare that anybody, if they really saw who we were, would want to stay with us. And so we tried our best to be somebody we weren't, or at least the best version of us that we thought we could be. But even the best version of you, and I know that's going around quite a bit, living your best life, being the best version of you. Listen, the best version of you is still real bad. <laughs> it's really, really bad. You can't, I can't be good without the grace of Almighty God. I can't. I can't. I got too much Adam on the inside of me. And I walk in such a way without the grace of God to prove it on a regular basis. And all I need is the opportunity to make it known. That's all I need. Without the difficulty of circumstance, I could be pretty all right. With respect to everybody else that thinks people are really, really bad out there, you know, we have that, that sliding scale of, of wicked. We got those people down there, the really, the murderers, the thieves. And then there's people up here who don't do any of the criminal activity. They just tell little white lies every once in a while. And we think they're good because the bad is really bad. And when we compare ourselves with ourselves, we deceive ourselves into thinking that somehow we are really good and don't need a savior because those people really do. Not proper. Not proper. We can't compare ourselves with the worst to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. We compare ourselves with the best. And that's Christ who is perfect. And nobody fits that. So all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody is good. And we prove it on a regular basis by walking wrong. And that, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Listen, there's a real devil. Jesus talked about him. Paul talked about him. 
He's got minions. He's got servants, demons. I know you don't feel like you're possessed, oppressed, inspired. I know you don't. But there's an enemy out there who doesn't even want you to know he exists. Because if you know he exists, then you'll run from him because he's really ugly and mean. There is nothing good about him. He is the author of bad. Everything about who he is is deceitful and wicked. And even the truth that he might share is to get you to believe a lie. He told Jesus, you know what the word says. You throw yourself off this building. The angels of God will protect you. That's how important you are. That's how special you are. I believe in you. <laughs> Boy, if you, if you have a little insecurity on the inside of you that needs stroking, you need a little ego boost for a moment, oh, you believe in me. All right, let me step. And lots of folks step. Step right off into something they shouldn't. Jump into things that they shouldn't because they believe they can be protected by God. Others might fall, but not them. I can do this, but God will see that I don't, don't hurt myself. They jump into relationships they shouldn't. They jump into situations they shouldn't. I can go to the club. Other people may not be able to, but I can. I can take it. <laughs> it won't hurt me. Jesus quips back. No insecurity on the inside of him. No ego that needs to be stroked. It also says, you got to know all your Bible now. That's why you need to <laughs> read your Bible every day. And it also says you shall not test the Lord your God. The enemy just goes, mm. he knows this word. Mm. Even the little bit of truth that the enemy does have, he tries to get you to believe in a lie. He is all bad. And when we walked according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the sons of disobedience, we're talking about inspiration here that is not from heaven. And it's a little bit scary if you really understand it. And Paul is trying to help the people at Ephesus know the condition in which they were when he found them. They were bad off. And then he doesn't want to just be somebody who's out there talking about him. He says, and I want you to know, we were right there with you. We were also right there in it, formerly giving ourselves to the lust of the world and our flesh. And, and I mean, it was, it was bad. And we were by nature children of wrath just like you. And so as he brings the, the final blow, the, 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 the ultimate consequence to all of our disobedience, Paul identifies with the people that he's beginning to, to do what he can to convict so that he can bring the mercy that allows them to be healed from whatever pride they might have according to their own, because they believe they can trust in their own deeds. And he says, we by nature also, with you, we're children of wrath. I realize that, that um, it's a common phrase for people to categorize all of humanity as children of God. And I know what they're trying to say, but theologically, it is completely inaccurate. I know they're trying to say God loves everybody and he does. I get that. But when you talk about being his kids, the only way you get there is if you believe that Jesus Christ died on your behalf, rose on your behalf, and you give your life to him and accept the sacrifice that he made on your behalf in substitution for your death so that you can now live his life. That is the only way you become God the Father's son or daughter. That's it. Otherwise, you by nature are a child of deserving of wrath not a very happy sermon is it <laughs> I'm getting to the happy part though you got it listen if, if you go to the doctor you don't want him to tell you you're doing fine if you got cancer tell me the truth please even if it hurts I need to know so I know how to how to begin to prepare what can I do to address this issue this is how we were if you're a believer. This is how you are if you're not. But the beauty is this. God loves you so much. Paul paints a pretty bleak picture in the first four verses. But he's only talking about history. And then he says, but God. But God. God cares so much that he chooses 
to apply his mercy to your life intentionally. Even if it means it's even if it means he has to sacrifice himself to do it. He will get you right. That's how much he cares. But God being rich in mercy. But God being rich in mercy. <laughs> Some of us are poor in mercy. Some of us don't have any at all. I mean, it's better to be poor than not have any at all. Poor, you got a little bit. God is wealthy in mercy. And if there is ever a time in the history of sermonic presentations for you to say amen, that is it. God is wealthy in mercy. He will not run out when it comes to you. Seven billion people on the planet. I don't know how many have existed before us. Let's, let's round it out for all of humanity at, at 30. 30 billion people, and he still hadn't run out. His mercy is unplumbable, unfathomable. His mercy does not have a bottom. Now, it doesn't mean that he doesn't allow consequences to come if you've done something wrong. And please, don't think that that is not an expression of his mercy. Because even in the midst of the consequences that you might experience for your misdeed, you're still breathing. I mean, the ultimate judgment for our lives is that you no longer have an opportunity to repent. And that means you don't breathe anymore. And so anytime you're experiencing difficulty, two things you don't need to say. Why me? Why God? Why you is real easy to answer. You actually believe you deserve better? You, you sinner you. You actually believe you deserve better? What about this life and all that you have done? All that Brett has done to deny Christ, to live wrong, and to do what he wants in spite of what God says? What about my life? Should I ever begin to think that I don't deserve the absolute worst that should come to me? I deserve death that if I don't get it, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. We were in South Carolina on vacation last week. Myrtle Beach is a lot of fun. And we were at a restaurant and uh, eating breakfast that I don't normally eat on vacation. I splurge. It's, it's, it's Belgian waffles with bananas and pecans and whipped cream on top and syrup with some biscuits and gravy on the side. I just, I just get so happy on vacation. I'm telling you, it's really great. I gained about five pounds, but I ain't mad about it. And we had this waitress who was really sweet. And at the end, I said, listen, is there anything we can pray for you about? And um, all my family was there. And this woman says, well, it's a long list. I said, well, give me your top three. <laughs> she says, well, I don't believe in God. I said, okay. Well, tell me, where'd you, where'd you get to, how'd you get to that point, and, and what are the issues? She said, well, my daughter had heart surgery, uh, open heart surgery, and she died in the operating table, and my mama died a year later, and my husband left me, and I came down here about six days ago, just packed up my truck and moved from Boston to South Carolina because I wanted to get away from life. And then she said, well, I, it's not that I really don't believe in God. I'm just, I'm just confused. She said, I, I know a lot of people have it worse than me. And I said, yeah, a lot of people might have it worse than you, but God really cares about where you are. And your pain is real to him prayed for for 15 seconds it was an embarrassment, a weeping in the restaurant she didn't know what to do, my kids were praying it was quite a moment gave her the card and we didn't have time to pray with her about salvation but she was right there going to give her to Pastor Donnell who's down there planting our church in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina And I sat there and, and I thought, humanity is experiencing difficulty. Everybody going through something. Everybody. But there's nobody who's going through something. And I realize what I'm about to say is difficult. But it's true. There's nobody who's going through something that really doesn't deserve it. 
Let me give you a definition. Grace is receiving that which you don't deserve. Grace is receiving that which you don't deserve. Mercy. Did I say that right? Yeah. Mercy is not receiving what you do deserve. Grace is receiving that which you don't deserve. Mercy is not receiving what you do deserve. And even though your life may not be what it, what it should, and you would think, most people think my life is just so great circumstantially because, gosh, Pastor, you, you live right. I mean, it's your profession. You have to live right, right? And so, like, God has to bless your life in such miraculous ways and it's really, really special. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know anybody who is more blessed than me. But it's not because of the absence of problems. And when problems do come to my life, and believe me, they are replete. I got a bunch of them. I don't say, why me? I say this, God, I'm grateful for your mercy that allows me the privilege of experiencing this difficulty. Because otherwise, I would not have the, the freedom or the expression to be able to, to work through and have a testimony in the end. Because you're going to do something through this that is going to be really wonderful, although it's very painful now. Rather than being mad about what's happening, you really need to be grateful about what's not Now, I'm not saying that every day you need to wake up with this woe is me attitude, this fait accompli that my life's going to be difficult. No, 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 I don't do that. I'm in faith every day. I believe that grace is meeting me and opening doors every place I need to go in order to advance the cause of Christ. I believe that his blessing is on my life. I believe that I'm his son, and he's going to prosper me in ways that, that are going to benefit the kingdom and the people around me. I, I am full of faith every day, but I am not entitled I don't live entitled so that when stuff bad happens, I'm not blaming him and trying to figure out, don't you know who I am? I can't believe, why me? No, no, no. You gave it to me in order for me to produce a testimony that allows others to understand what it feels like and looks like when God assists somebody to go through stuff. Because other people will and they don't know how to go through. Teach them. When you get to the other side. But God being rich in mercy. He is wealthy in mercy. He doesn't run out on you. Even with consequences. Don't think that he has quit on you. He cares about you deeply. Listen. He gave his son. To die for you. That's a pretty penny. Why would he throw you away so quick? I mean, when you pay a lot of money for something, you do your best to take care of it. I don't have time. I only have seven minutes left. But him being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. And the word great there is not the word mega, which is normally used in the, in the Greek New Testament to describe expansion or something large. But it's a word polis. And in this context, it's used much more as an adverb than it is as an adjective. Because of his love and the great love with which he loved us. Meaning not just how big it was, but how effective it was. Because of this amazing love with which he loved us. How powerful it was. How meaningful it was. Even when... <laughs> And then he juxtaposes, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. See, it's easy to love somebody when they're lovable. But God demonstrates his love for us and he loved us when we were going wrong. When there was a stench. Open the tomb, Jesus said at Lazarus' place of, of burial. Open the tomb. Oh, Jesus. It, it, it's been four days. I, mean, I, 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 I know you are who you are, but do you know how bad this is going to smell? 
Do, do, do you know what this is going to be like when we open it? Just his belly, He stinketh. <laughs> he stinketh, saith the King James. He stinketh. <laughs> open the tomb. God's willing to, to be around your, st- your stench. <laughs> Every day, he was living with the stench of death in your life. But he said, open the tomb. He didn't care. Because he loved you so much. He loved you so much. His love was great. Even while we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. And made us alive. Now, this is really the good part. This is where you ought to... I don't need any help this morning, but you do. So you you better say a lot of amens in this part. (laughs) Even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive. He made us alive. You didn't make yourself alive. He made you alive. Let me tell you how it happens. It happens by you saying, Lord, I surrender. Now, you have to participate in the process, but you don't make it happen in any way. It's called yielding. It's called surrendering. It's called giving up, saying, I don't want to live this life this way anymore. I don't want to hold on to the wheel anymore. I give it to you. I'm going to take not just a passenger seat, the back seat. And I'm not going to be a back seat driver. Wherever you tell me to go, I'm going to go. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to say. I'm going to say, I'm yours for the rest of my days. That's what surrender looks like. That's how you get made alive. When you decide, when you recognize that you are dead in your trespasses and sins and you need a savior to come back. He made us alive with him and then didn't just make us alive. That would have been enough. It would have been enough if he had just forgiven me. He didn't have to make me his boy. He didn't have to bless me. Just forgive me of everything I've done wrong and and alleviate my penalty. (laughs) Oh, thank you. I'm not going to suffer for all of eternity. That would have been great. But God loved me more than that. He made me alive with him, gave me his last name. If my people who are called by my name, he gave me his name. Christian, son of God, however you want to put it. He gave me his name, which meant I'm in the family. I'm not just a servant. I actually get an inheritance in this thing and I don't even deserve it. I haven't done anything. And remember, all of my children are going to get something. When when, when I pass, they're going to get something. Why? Simply because they're called by my name. It's not because they've done anything. Surely not because they've done anything. (laughs) It's because (laughs) because they're called by my name. I love them like that. They've disobeyed more than they've obeyed and we all have. It has nothing to do with compliance. It has everything to do with inheritance because they're mine. God gave me an inheritance. He made me alive with him. And then he said, I'm not just going to leave you there. He said, I'm going to seat you together with me in heavenly places. (laughs) So we go from six feet under, whatever a tomb looks like, to now being out of the tomb and not just being left on the planet, but being positioned in such a way that we are actually seated with Christ in heavenly places. Listen, grace gives you what you don't deserve. I don't deserve to be seated in that place. But I am. I'm seated with I'm seated with, not under him. Although I, I find myself wanting to always submit, but God puts me with him. I don't even know all of the theological implications of that. It's bigger than my mind can conceive, but I'm really happy about it. This is what love looks like to, to a person that was dead in his transgressions and sins. He seated us with me in heavenly places. Why? Because he wants to show you off. That he might unveil the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience. It says that he might unveil you to the world. That he might show you off as a trophy of what he does to people he loves so much. This is why he left you here. 
If it was all about just being seated with Christ in heavenly places, then somebody should have allowed you to experience that in reality and left you under the baptismal just a little bit longer. <laughs> left you there just so you could really be seated with him. But he left you here so he could unveil you to the This is what my mercy looks like. He wants to unveil you. It says so that in the ages to come, well, he wrote this 2,000 years ago. This is one of those ages. This is one of those ages. I, there are more to come, but this is one of them. In the ages to come, he might show folks stuff about what it means to be a trophy of his grace. Then he says, for by grace you have been saved. And then he gets to the, the crux of it. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. No one can work for it so that no one can boast. Grace is the only way that we can come into a relationship with him. It's him saying, here, I'm paying the price for your sin, and I'm in the same process elevating you to a place that you could have never come to on your own. I'm calling you my son and my daughter. I'm forgiving you for, ev for everything you've done wrong, everything you've said wrong, everything you've thought wrong, all that you are that is wrong. I am releasing you from that. And I am not just forgiving you, not just releasing you, but I'm bringing you into sonship and... Uh, it's important for me to concentrate on the term sonship because it has nothing to do with gender. It has everything to do with position in that in the Old Testament and New, sons were the ones who inherited from the Father. So even you beautiful daughters have sonship because you get an inheritance from him. An inheritance that not only includes heaven but includes a manifestation of his presence here I don't know why God walks with me. I'm not very good company. I don't think right. I don't talk right. But every day he greets me with his mercy and kindness. Every day he endures with my weaknesses. Maybe there are just not enough people who said yes. And so I was the last of the, 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 the possibilities. I don't know. But he continues to work with me. He is so amazing to me. He's got to be, I, I'm, I'm convinced he's got to have more grace with me than anybody on the planet. The angels work overtime for me, keeping me out of stuff, saving me from stuff, finding my stuff. I'm not kidding about that last one. I lose more stuff. And when I find it, I don't thank angels. I thank God. I don't have conversations with angels. They don't want to talk to me. They do not want to. Don't you talk to angels. No need. Don't, you don't, they're not trying to develop a relationship with you. They're servants of the Father. You talk to the Father. The Father sends them to do what they need to do. They give charge concerning you. And when they do what they're supposed to do, you just thank God. You don't thank them. And they're not mad about it. I am grateful for His grace. I'm saved not as a result of anything I've done, but because of everything he's done. Amen. And as I close, as I close, I'm not only saved from, I'm saved to. Saved from my, my former life and myself and saved to the purposes of God here, right living here, Saved to victory here. When I say victory, everybody here ought to have more victories daily than you have defeats. Sadly, it is the rare thing when a Christian actually experiences victorious living. Because everybody says, I'm only human. Who did he write this Bible to? Who did he give his promises to? To whom did he give his, his spirit and power to? 
What do you mean you're only human? You are human, therefore you have access to stuff that animals don't. You got access to power, provision, relationship that is intended to give you the ability to have more victory than defeat. There's no guarantee of perfection. That is long since gone. That ship has sailed a long time ago. But consistency ought to be the order of the day for you. Victory over your own soul, over your circumstances, plowing through even when you you, you want the mountain to move. But God says, scale it. You don't give up. Yes, sir. I'm I'm, going to keep climbing. You, You experience more victory. That's what we believe here as a church. Why? Because that's what his grace has come to give. Let's pray.